If you drew a pie chart of global greenhouse gas emissions, one of the biggest slices, arguably the biggest slice, could be labeled buildings. Almost 40% of the world's greenhouse gas footprint comes from the construction, operation, and the energy it takes to power, heat, and to cool buildings. Buildings, as it happens, present a unique and complex challenge for reducing emissions. By 2050, most gasoline cars you see on the road today will have been replaced, likely by electric or other zero emission vehicles. Many industrial facilities will have been retrofitted or transformed, but buildings are different. In 2050, we'll still be using most of the buildings we use today. So without question, we need to make buildings more efficient. But how can we provide the same functionality and comfort using less energy? Well, hidden somewhere in most buildings is an HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and in some cases, air conditioning. And most solutions to make HVAC systems more efficient are hardware solutions, big upgrades that take a lot of time and cost a lot of money. But a software solution could be a quicker and easier way to reduce emissions at a lower cost, all while keeping the buildings as comfortable as ever, which is where shift energy comes in. Shift uses machine learning to manage HVAC systems, meeting the needs of residents and reducing energy consumption, thereby reducing emissions, often down to the minute by minute. So we sat down with Alan Zurikowski, Senior VP of Strategic Alliances at Shift Energy, to discuss using software to make hardware more efficient, integrating with new and old systems, and how to balance the needs of all the people who all use buildings in different ways. Here, on Carbon Copy. I'm uh, Alan Zurichowski. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Alliances. Uh, here at uh, at Shift Energy, Sh Shift Energy, by the way, is uh, is a business unit within uh, a, a larger company called Mariner Partners, headquartered in uh, Atlantic Canada. Well, being headquartered in Atlantic Canada, Mariner Partners and Shift Energy, for that matter, are not yet household names here in Alberta. So, tell me a little bit about Mariner Partners broadly, and maybe more specifically about Shift Energy. Yeah, sure. So, on, on uh, for Mariner Partners, um, Mariner Partners is actually uh, quite a large uh, technology product and services company, almost 400 employees in Atlantic Canada. And, uh, and, and actually, Mariner Partners serves customers in, uh, in over 10 countries around the world. Um, but the the business unit shift energy absolutely is not a household name yet. I would I would put us in the category of a uh, of a startup in this in this climate tech industry. Now, I understand maybe incorrectly that Mariner Partners or maybe just Shift Energy, but between somewhere between the two organizations, it's an employee owned company. So, what's your perspective? Is that accurate? What's your perspective on that? And does it help to coalesce the team in a common vision and purpose. Yeah, for sure. Mariner Partners is a employee privately owned company for sure. Um, I, you know, I think as a, from a startup perspective, uh, the business unit in, in Shift Energy is solely focused on uh, on this climate tech or, or property tech sector in terms of energy efficiency for buildings and carbon reduction for buildings. That's really the the coalescence, if you will, uh, everybody is focused on this mission to uh, reduce uh, reduce carbon and greenhouse gas emissions for 2030 and 2050. Yeah, so you talk about shift energy providing energy mm -hmm. and carbon reduction software services. Can you expand on that a bit in terms of what your major product line is? What is the core technology, if you have one? Yes, yeah, we absolutely do. We're relatively unique uh, in this climate tech sector. So, so what is it that we provide? So we're, we're, we're basically a software company. Um, our, uh, our IP is around what we call industrial class machine learning software. 
and we boost the performance of, uh, of HVAC systems in buildings. HVAC are heating, ventilation, and, and air conditioning. All the stuff that's in the, in the ceilings and, and downstairs in the basement that run, you know, large commercial buildings, uh, college, university campuses, hospitals, sporting ven venues, um, and they all have HVAC systems. We're unique in that most HVAC solutions to reduce carbon emissions or uh, reduce energy consumption are typically very equipment based. So people, building owners typically are buying, have capital budgets where they're buying more equipment. We're a software company. So that, that makes us unique in this space. Um, but we are fortunate we come up with the same end goals. We're able to uh, again, reduce energy consumption, which is directly related in a large building to reducing carbon emissions. So, you know, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into your energy optimization software, in, in part because that's where our organizations have crossed paths, which we can talk about later. But first, if you don't mind, what what is this software platform or system and how is it different from the way energy is optimized and managed now or previously? Yeah, great, great question. So these uh, these big HVAC systems, uh, of which there are several, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that, that sell them, companies like uh, Johnson Controls and Honeywell and Schneider, uh, Siemens and Schneider Electric, uh, these HVAC systems come, come with a, a, a software, if you will, a software application called, called a BAS or a building automation system. Some people call them building management systems. And, and they've been around for years, 30, 40 plus years. And these BAS systems or, or BMSs that, that manage the HVAC systems, their main purpose in life is to make sure everyone's comfortable in the building, make sure the temperature is good, all the other things around uh, humidity and air pressure and carbon dioxide levels as well. But temperature is obviously the big one, and especially in Canada, right? Make sure the building's cool in the summer so it's comfortable to work in and it's warm in the winter. So it's comfortable as well. That's their primary purpose. And, uh, and the reality is sometimes, uh, first off, if that's your primary goal to make sure everyone's comfortable, that is not necessarily the same end goal as uh, making sure the building is running as efficiently as it can, can be from an energy uh, consumption perspective and also from a carbon reduction perspective. And in some cases, some place, in some cases, those things can be complementary, but in some cases, those two goals can be opposing as well. So that's where shift energy comes in. We, we take, a, I guess, a supervisory role of the, of the BAS system that's managing the HVAC system, and we fine tune it with our software, literally, you know, down to the minute, making, you know, a lot of minute adjustments across all of the various control mechanisms inside a building to make sure that it's constantly running at its optimum energy consumption level and in in direct relation that means it's also uh, running uh, at the at the most efficient way it can be with regards to reducing carbon as well so if that's all right let's shift our energy for a second to talk a little bit about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions reductions that's sort of the core of our mandate as an organization on a day-to-day -day basis, when people talk about climate change, you often hear about large industrial emissions from energy production and manufacturing in particular. And on the consumer side, you hear a lot about transportation, and that's very visible. I see electric vehicles every time I'm on the road, which was not the case 10 years ago. But buildings are where we live, where we work, where we receive medical treatments, and frankly, where we spend most of our time. How important are buildings in the overall fight against climate change? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. So, yeah, when you look at the stats uh, globally, um, the numbers I've seen, there are typically three main sectors with regards to uh, reducing greenhouse gases. Buildings typically are about 30 percent. Um, transportation is roughly about 30 percent, and then industrial manufacturing is the other 30 percent. So. 30% is significant. And, uh, and when you look at uh, a city, uh, and I'll use, use an example, because uh, I've seen some recent stats for, for Boston and New York City, so those municipalities, 
the the energy consumption as a result of buildings and the resultant carbon emissions as a result of buildings in those two cities is actually 70%, seven zero. Now there's obviously not a lot of industrial industrial manufacturing facilities in those two very large cities. So it, the majority is buildings. Um, so that that's, that's significant indeed. So then if we can go maybe just one level deeper and talk about energy optimization. If I think about the greenhouse gas footprint of a building, I guess the first thing that I think of the building envelope, I think of where the building gets its energy and I think about how that energy is managed. I mean, first of all, is that the right way to think about it or are there other major categories to think about? And secondly, can can you give me a sense of scale for how impactful energy optimization software can be provincially, nationally, or globally even within the context of that that 30% globally that you talked about with respect to buildings? Yeah, great, great question. So for the uh, for these buildings and the 30%, if you're a if you're a building owner, in fact, I'll start with New York City and Boston, they actually have legislation in place where you have to reduce your carbon emissions. Uh, they have targets 2030s, one target, 50% of the way there, 2050, 100% of the way there is, is another target. As, as you know, buildings, compared to transportation or industrial, particularly in transportation, the buildings we see today uh, in our cities, I, I would guess they're probably all still going to be here in 2030, in a few years from now. And my guess, certainly the large buildings, they will, most of them will probably be here in 2050 as now. So the building owners have a unique problem, unlike the transportation sector, where typically I would say by 2050, most of the gas powered vehicles we have today probably won't be around, they'll be replaced. So these building owners have a real uphill battle with regards to uh, their capital budgets in terms, how are they gonna get to uh, a zero carbon footprint by, by 2050? And I, I picked on Boston and New York. There's other municipalities as well. They actually have a sliding scale of carbon reduction targets between now and 2050. So it's not a step function. Every year, you've got to show that you're reducing. So again, this, this climate tech uh, industry is relatively traditional. Usually the solutions, they come to address problems like this. In this case, you know, energy reduction and carbon reduction are very capital, capital intensive. So a building owner will typically look at obvious things like let's replace the lighting with LED lighting. Um, you know, a large capital cost, you know, and typically will take, you know, several months to do if you have a 20, 30, 40 story office tower. Or let's look at the thermal, the the, uh, the outside skin of the building and look at the, uh, you know, the thermal energy efficiency of that. Should we put in more insulation? Should we replace the windows that are more efficient? Again, very large capital intensive projects. And that's typically what most building owners are looking at. Shift energy is unique in that, relatively speaking, there's zero capital. You go in, uh, we install our software, it'll take a couple of weeks, and you can immediately start seeing the benefits of the optimization with regards to reducing the energy consumption and, and, and in turn, the, the carbon emissions. Carbon Copy is brought to you by Emissions Reduction Alberta. ERA takes action on climate change and supports economic growth by investing in clean technology solutions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, lower costs, attract investment, and create jobs here in Alberta. These investments help innovators develop and demonstrate technology that can lower emissions at home and be exported all over the world. That's why we've committed almost $800 million to 220 projects, worth a total of $6.5 billion. To learn more, visit eralberta.ca. I understand that ERA, the organization that I work with, and one of our funding partners, SDTC, Sustainable Development Technology Canada, jointly co-funded a demonstration of the EOS technology at a number of buildings. Can you tell me about what that project entailed and what kind of buildings in Alberta specifically were involved? Yeah, I'd love to. And we are very grateful to both ERA and SDTC uh, for helping us with this funding with these pilot projects because because uh, we learned a lot. In Alberta specifically, uh, this is a couple of years ago, we had our project. We we put our software into four buildings. So it was a combination of uh, you know large office tower, uh, health facilities, hospitals, and, uh, and a retail commercial space. 
and uh, and on average in those four buildings, we saw roughly about a 20, 25 uh, percent gain in terms of energy efficiency, which was really encouraging for us. And and again, by 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 you know in uh, in recognition of of ERA's funding and SDT's funding. Uh, to help us with those pilots and prove that in, we're very happy that of those four buildings in Alberta, three of them are actually still customers with us today. So just with my sales hat on, a 75% win rate is is always a good day. So that was that was fantastic. Nick, can you, if you look back on the project, can you talk a little bit about what some of the outcomes have been and, and what you what did you learn through these demonstrations? Yeah, good, good question. A, a couple of things, probably, one of the main ones, and we've touched on this earlier in the questions you were asking me, is uh, this is a software solution. And and building owners, property management owners, they're not used to, frankly, purchasing software to solve a problem. They're used to capital budgets and, and buying equipment. So that was one learning in terms of just how do you bring, as a startup, how do you bring your solution to market? How do you message it? How do you position it? How do you, how do you market it? Because uh, this is new behavior. The folks, the folks you're selling to, operations managers, right, they are, they are worried about day-to-day -day things in a building that might have nothing to do with energy, right? If it's in the winter, are the pathways cleared of, of snow? Is everything working prob properly? Is there plumbing problems in the building? There's just a huge variety of tasks. So bringing in a software solution, that, that was a learning for us from a, from a go-to-market perspective as well. A related one as well, when you look at these really large, large buildings, um, there is a, an, an owner, of course, of the building, but they'll have what I call an ecosystem of partners who are helping them maintain it. They'll have uh, consultants, they'll have what we call uh, master systems integrators, they'll have the control systems vendors, they'll have mechanical uh, engineers, they'll have electrical engineers. There's a lot potentially uh, of companies who are actually helping them on the day-to-day -day on the day-to-day -day basis uh, operating these buildings. So it's quite complex, not only s providing a different value proposition, in our case software, to the building owners, but also working through that ecosystem of all these partners who are involved uh, in the decision or influencing the decision, a buying decision in one way or another. Yeah, that's fantastic. So if I if I can probe a little bit further on those, you, you talked a little bit about capital budgets and, and the focus of building operators. And you talked a little bit about a complex web of players involved in day-to-day -day operations of a building and in, in a number of um, facets, I should say. So those those sound like challenges and, and learnings that you've had. What have you developed in response to those learnings? How can you overcome those barriers? As a software solution, you know, what's the approach that you've, you've realized that you can now take to, to, to get into the buildings and start seeing some of those improvements, as you said, almost immediately? Yeah, great question, Mark. And uh, the answer to that is in a couple of different, uh, a couple of different disciplines. On, on the product side, uh, I think what we learned by virtue of the pilots that ERA and SDC, SDTC helped us with, is uh, we really have to be mindful of what I call the, the personas of the people who are using the software applications. So there's a building owner who's probably uh, very financially conscious, right? They're very much aware of the energy consumption, what that cost is. If they're filing reports to a regulator, say ESG reports, they're very much aware of the of the data and conscious of the data that they need to file those reports on a on a yearly basis to showing their carbon reduction. So on a on a on a product basis, that that's one persona. If there's an operator of the building, the person who's maintaining the tenant comfort uh, across a whole building or across a whole venue, uh, they they of course are aware and mindful of energy savings. But their day-to-day -day, um, task is to make sure that the customers, the tenants, are all happy. So that's their number one goal. And they have a different set of needs. So when you have you know, vi different visualization aspects of, of reports um, or information in the software, what we learned is we really have to be conscious of, of who's using this at, at any one time. That's one area. A second discipline, I'll just touch on this one, is just from a, a sales go-to-market perspective as a, as a software company, 
um, how you message your uh, the value of your application and what it does it has to take into account the personas, but it also has to take into account how you go to market and what this very complex and large regionally based ecosystem of, of climate tech companies and, and property tech companies in North America taught us is you, you really need partners when you go to market. You can't go it alone as a software company. So speaking of data, can you tell me what were the outcomes of, I'm going to say these three installations that are still up and running in Alberta, are, are they saving energy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, unequivocally, it's a, it's a capital yes, uh, bold faced and, and underlined. Yeah, which is why, which is why they're staying with us, right? So not only are they, are they seeing year over year energy savings, uh, which is great, but also by virtue of the fact that our application again is, is connected to this HVAC system called a BAS. It's collecting data every minute from the building. So when it comes to carbon emission reporting in particularly, they're able now to reliably have a have a reliable data source for all of the uh, all of the numbers that they need to report on a year to year basis. And again, this is data now we're in the we're in the I'm talking about software, right, is you you have all this data available, you have all this historical data available as well, you're able to do trend analysis and understand, okay, if we keep uh, improving at the rate we are, we know where we're going to be at 2030. If we have 2030 targets, we know we're going to be at 2040. We know we're going to be at 2050. So not only can we file the reports uh, to the regulator as needed based on that data, we can actually make decisions in terms of are we meeting our targets or not and understanding the financials around what where we need to be from a carbon reduction perspective. So if it's a, a capital yes, bold-faced and underlined, that, that sounds like a resounding success. Based on this success, what then is next for the EOS technology? And you touched on it a little bit, but if you, if you don't mind diving a little bit deeper, and then can we expect to see this in more and more buildings going forward? Yeah, sure. So the first question uh, on the product side, um, so we, our, our pilots, uh, our, uh, we did a couple of years ago with ERA and SDTC, they were focused on what I call the air side of the building, which is the HVAC that I, that I described. Large buildings uh, typically have uh, university campuses, hospitals, some large commercial buildings as well. They typically have what we call a central plant. In addition to all of the, you know, air side things that are in the floors in the whole building, the central plant in Canada certainly has two main functions. One is a heating system and a cooling system. So the heating system is typically a boiler, um, typically in Canada run by natural gas, uh, not not always by electricity. And the cooling system is something called a chiller plant. What's next for us is we've been doing research specifically on the chiller plant because it's a it's a large consumer of energy. These chiller plants consume between 30 and sometimes 40 percent of a building's total electricity needs. So we've focused on uh, our research the last couple of years on this uh, machine learning uh, methodology and algorithm to optimally control a chiller plant holistically as well. So that's what you'll be seeing uh, from us in the in the next year, which we're pretty excited about. And what we're hearing from the market as well um, is a lot of interest again, because these these building owners are seeing these uh, these regulations coming and these impending targets that they have to hit, and uh, and they're looking for alternate ways to to do that. That's very exciting. So. If we go back to the broader decarbonization conversation for a second, I'm, I'm really curious how the technology, in particular the energy optimization software, interplays with other climate mitigation efforts. In particular, if we see, let's say, a greater drive for electrification of heating, or if we see more and more district energy loops, for example, is that synergistic or antagonistic to your energy optimization software? Yeah, I think it's I think it's complementary. Yeah, I'd put it on the on the synergistic side. So we've uh, we, the United States is a big market for us. I'll I'll start there. At today, there are, there are five municipalities. There's five cities in the United States where the municipal government has legislated uh, punitive legislation that building owners of any reasonable size have to reduce their carbon emissions, which means in turn, they have to reduce their energy consumption. And you get these five cities, New York, 
Boston, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., San Francisco. In, in Boston or New York City, as an example, if you, if you don't reduce your targets, and they're all starting in 2024 or 2025, you have to report this year and last year, depending on the city, and then start reducing in the next couple of years and show a scale of reduction up to 2050. If you don't reduce, first off, if you don't report, you'll be fined. And if you don't reduce, you will also be fined. So there's financial consequences which drive the market, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so then if I zoom back out once again, are there any other next big things for Shift Energy or the Mariner Partners as a whole? You, you talked about the, the chiller plants and you, you talked about proliferation potentially of, the, of energy optimization software. Is, is there anything else? Sure, sure. And I think this ties into your to your previous question as well, right? Is is can the the big the big question for everyone, not just commercial building owners, is can the electrical grid uh, provide green energy at the same pace that we need to to hit these targets in 2030, 2040 and and 2050. So, the electrical grid, of course, that's a whole another discussion for someone else and what is the capital cost to uh, to upgrade that? But building owners are conscious of this. So if they're being driven to go 100% uh, electric, as they are, and we see lots of evidence of that going on in, in New York State and in Massachusetts as well right now, how are they going to do it while they're waiting for the electrical grid? So looking at these optimization technologies, we think we're in the right place uh, with our machine learning software. There's other systems at play. I think thermal energy storage is one of the big ones, especially with regards to uh, cooling systems within a, within a building. And we're talking to several building owners uh, about that as right, right now. And from a technology perspective, from a product perspective, what's missing because it's early days is, uh, again, similar to an HVAC system. You can buy, uh, there are energy efficient solutions for systems on their own. But from a holistic perspective across a whole building, is there, a, is there an energy efficient optimization solution that takes into account the HVAC system, the cooling system, the heating system when it's needed, a thermal energy storage system, perhaps a battery energy storage system? And is there a holistic uh, supervisory control software that can manage all that, take into account not only tenant comfort from a building perspective, but also other, you know, ancillary systems like like emergency systems that are needed. So as we as we head down to this path to 100% electrification, I think there's a lot of opportunities on the technology side because we're we're breaking new ground in terms of how all these systems not only have to interwork with each other, but optimally be efficient with each other as well. So is there anything I didn't ask you today, or you didn't get a chance to talk about that you'd want our listeners to know? Any sort of final words? I think my uh, I think my last last thought on that question, Mark, would be uh, something that we've learned uh, from the market since we did our pilots with the RA and SDCC is just uh, how the market has changed. I think in the last couple of years, specifically with regards to regulation. I think when we started out on this journey, energy consumption and and the financial uh, benefits of reducing energy consumption. I think were was the headline, and for sure decarbonization was in there as well. But that those tables have turned now. We're talking to more and more customers, and prospects where it's a decarbonization is at the top on the headline in terms of a goal and priority. For sure, energy savings and financial savings are important as well, and and it's this this shift, uh, frankly, that the regulators. Uh, are are pushing not only with legislation as I described earlier that that's punitive in some municipalities and I think we're going to see a lot lot more of that as well but just the shift in terms of what the priority is so that that regulatory change in the market uh, is uh, is is a big learning for us for sure and that's that's driving urgency uh, again for the owners of these buildings to to make some changes yeah and I think I think we all hear that urgency right now is sort of what we need well thank you very much for your time today it's been um delightful talking to you and learning a little bit more about the the brains of the buildings and uh and the the action that your team is taking to to help address climate change in the building realm so i really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today thanks mark uh, and i uh, i appreciate your time as well and as i mentioned earlier we we sincerely appreciate the support from era and sdtc too